Hello and welcome on Primetime Watchmaking in the News and I know we didn't publish a November episode because instead we simply wanted to share with you a special and rather full 2018 edition coming back on the main watchmaking highlights and trends of the year. But first of all, thanks so much uh, for your appreciation of what we do here on The Watches TV. You are now close to 88,000 subscribed to this channel and we clearly know that we mainly talk about some pretty niche and exclusive things. So I think this is already quite remarkable. I guess uh, we could be a bit more popular if we mix some more affordable brands. Uh, but I have to say that unfortunately uh, we are a bit too privileged having access to the very top of qualitative watchmaking and I just wanted to stress out that there is really nothing snobbish about what we do. We just love the art of watchmaking, we love the people behind these crafts and we indeed prefer to focus on stories where this notion of art is at its core. And this is naturally found in those unique brands and places we can visit. But I would also like to say a mega special thanks to our patrons who make it possible. Your support really means a lot to us and definitely helps us very concretely and independently in sharing what true watchmaking is all about. And one last thing, because I have to confess that we are taking a bit more time than expected for the formal introduction of, of the Watches.club. Uh, but very soon you will know more and I just wanted to add that all patrons will become automatic members and gain some pretty cool advantages. So it's soon Christmas and all contributions are immensely appreciated and welcome. Link below if anyone inspired. So off we go and let's say that 2018 has been an interesting year with some pretty important structural changes throughout the business with for instance the necessary evolution of watch related events, the predominance of the big power brands, how the digital marketplace has finally been embraced by brands, the significance of independent uh, watchmakers, impact of the revised Swiss made criteria, the general trend of more affordable watch collection, the crazy world of auctions and the development of its spin-offs. Well plenty of things, a rather rich program and uh, you just hang in there and I'll try to make it as dense and summarized as possible. Okay, so let's start by talking about the business in general, even though we don't have all the numbers concerning this year. But, uh, but this doesn't prevent us of already interpreting some of these figures and sharing with you some general trends. Coming back on recent history, 2014 really represented the climax of success for the Swiss industry as a whole. And it followed a pretty crazy streak of uninterrupted uh, record years. So what could go wrong when you only know success? Well, that was about to change and we already talked about this a few times. But after a couple of difficult years for the industry, 2018 seemed to show a slight rebound and reflects not only a slightly better world economic climate, but also the brand's ability to come up with more desired and better positioned products. So Swiss experts figures are back on the increase in terms of volume, uh, but this has to be taken with some kind of fine caution and this for a number of reasons. Export figures just mean precisely this, export figures. Watches that have gone out of Switzerland and doesn't uh, necessarily mean watches that got actually sold on the various markets coming out of the dealers and being bought by you guys. And we know uh, that from the past that uh, this has been a very practical way of reassuring shareholders that your company, your group was performing well. And you have to remember that uh, most of the big uh, brands belong to publicly traded uh, companies who need to come up with some sexy numbers to keep the value of their shares or better increase them. So creating stocks on the market has always been a very convenient way of hiding the true performance and success of watch brands. And uh, the very immense uh, downside of this is that at one moment or another, well, these stocks, well, somebody has to take care of them. I mean, thus uh, gray market channels being fueled discreetly and or brands having to repurchase these stocks at some high cost for them. So one of the benefits of the small crisis that, did, uh, that hit the industry of the last few years is that brands and groups took their responsibilities, bought back large portions of these unwanted watches and tried to dry out this grey market despite the fact that you can still find so much out there. But nevertheless, some of them did their best. But in a system where eternal growth is seen as the only solution for survival, well, I think this is highly questionable and should we not focus more on meaning and sustainability instead? Well, at least this is what we try to concentrate here on the Watchers TV. Okay, so let's go back to this year's number because yes, we saw increase in export, but I will mix numbers from 2017 and 18 to make my point. Overall, the Swiss industry exports 24 million watches per year, representing roughly 90 billion Swiss francs. That's approximately 19 billion, billion US dollars. So 24 million watches, that's not bad. But again, you have to put this into perspective of approximately 1 billion watches being produced around the planet. 
Well, the Swiss industry by definition uh, represents a very small part of this, though in value it accounts for a huge portion and this is what makes our position here in Switzerland very special. We benefit from an astounding image worldwide, one based on quality, history, legitimacy, clever marketing and so forth and we can only be very proud and happy about this. But we have uh, for sure some pretty strong challenges ahead of us and we seriously need to keep this in mind. In the year 2000, expert figures represented almost 30 million watches for a value of 9 billion. In other words, and in a bit less than 20 years, we export 20% less, but the overall value has more than doubled, meaning that the average mean price has significantly increased and this is where it becomes very interesting for us. Watches priced above $3,000 only represent 5% of overall export, but 50% in terms of value. This segment of the Swiss watch industry is the only one which has enjoyed a strong growth in 2018, plus 11%, whereas watches below that price point are kind of on a decline, facing, for instance, very strong challenges from smart watches. I mean, the Apple Watch is already selling more units than the entire Swiss watch industry, and this will continue and even increase in the next years. So the main point to understand is that even if the high-end segment is performing pretty well, well, watchmaking still needs the industrial capabilities and know-how to exist. Otherwise, I mean, we would only be talking about artisan brands and or, I mean, prices would be even higher for, for mid-level and high-end uh, type of brands and their products. So additional to this, where are these watches mainly sold? And if you look at the figures, well, we clearly see a very strong dependency to uh, the Asian market in general. In the top 10 countries buying Swiss watches, five are Asians and Hong Kong, with a population slightly above 7 million people, is number one. But you have to see Hong Kong more as a distribution hub and the USA being second, and the UK, Germany, France, and Italy also in this top 10. So yes, as long as the economy is not doing too bad in these countries, and or that tourism is still growing a lot of sales, well, I guess we're kind of okay. But uh, there are already some signs of slowing economies, such as in China, even though the size of the market is huge by essence. So in a more unpredictable world, what impact will this have in 2019 still re uh, remains to be seen, and I don't want to be spooky about it, of course. Okay, a way of protecting the perceived value of Swiss watches has been the introduction of new Swiss-made criteria, meaning that today 60% of a watch's value has to come from Switzerland before it used to be 50%. Well, in general, this is good, but what it means is that since a long time, some Swiss brands have been subcontracting some of its manufacturing to cheaper places and therefore part of its know-how too in the same process. And it's not surprising to see some people talk more in favor of some other alternatives in terms of watch provenance since you can find of, uh, some kind of comparable quality and creativity elsewhere. So this is very interesting but definitely represents an additional form of competition and this is uh, in particular for Swiss brands that are already kind of struggling and I say this because for me 2018 really marks the dawn of the superpower brands. I know we've always had stronger players than others but now this club of approximately Ultimately, uh, 10 brands are really in a category of their own. And I mean Rolex, Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, Omega, Longines, Hublot, Richard Mille, Alibilussi, Cartier and a few others. And they are not all clones. I mean, they are not all in the same, uh, same segment, neither produce the same number of watches, but they all benefit from a huge power of attraction, mainly due to their mastery of marketing with the budgets, obviously, that comes along. But of course, with also identifiable uh, and iconic and qualitative products, brand whose product pricing in a certain way doesn't need to reflect some kind of economic rationale. When you're talking luxury, one of its components is often the, the decorrelation of the price of the object and the cost of its actual production. And there are obviously limits to this, but the absolute true judge of this is the market. And for these brands, well, they seem to get everything right. The highly desirable products, even managing scarcity pretty cleverly. Think of the steel Rolex craze today, uh, promoting their image with huge means and how frustrating it must be for the remaining ones to try to attach their wagon on this rolling train of success, which by the way is getting stronger and stronger. It's kind of a virtuous or vicious circle depending on which side you find yourself as a brand. So entry price to be part of the club is almost unattainable today and it really feels like this kind of winner takes all situation. So yes, this may sound pretty bleak for the followers and that's the main reason why they have to be even more clever with their various strategies and try to remain appealing regardless. But probably accept uh, the position that they're in, accepting in some cases to produce less, come with more affordable products and this is something we're starting seeing more and more this year. But then we have the type of brands that we love here 
and that are in a totally different category and I'm naturally talking about this uh, independent uh, watchmaking scenes. Brands uh, that are generally headed by watchmakers or visionaries who stick with this notion of art, mechanical art and we see and feel uh, so much more interest by the public for this and naturally this makes me very happy. I mean think for instance at the feedback we got from people attending Baselworld this year and their true appreciation of the atelier section of the show where people could meet and talk to the watchmakers, better understand their products, share precious moments with them and this is something I witness also through other events held worldwide. So this obviously lets me rebound on the evolution of these fairs since 2018 has really been marked by a clear defiance from so many brands towards such events. We've seen huge numbers of brands putting out and 2019 will uh, most certainly be a very pivotal moment and these fairs really have to be very extremely careful if they simply don't want to disappear from the yearly calendar. Again, I really think that these events are really necessary but their mission must evolve and implicate much more the end consumer. Like I said previously, the absolute judge is you, the consumer, whether active or not. And by this I mean that we can't all buy super expensive watches, but we can all appreciate and respect these products. We, meaning you and me, are part in maintaining the hype around them. And this also creates a lot of value. We are good advocates and even for those actually capable of buying them. Knowing that a wider group of people understand more these uh, timepieces and are even sometimes literally drooling at these objects, I think it increases their general appreciation. And if you're privileged enough of possessing uh, such an object, well, you should feel even better or more proud of having such beauties on your wrist. So these events should definitely contribute uh, with this mission and it's really going to be very interesting to see how Baselworld will tackle this uh, for its next edition as they are the hardest hit uh, by this. For instance, I mean, you know, with the entire pullout of the Swatch Group, can you imagine this? No one would have thought of this a few years ago. I mean, it's quite shocking, but you know, welcome to a new reality. Well, I'm receiving tons of emails from the organizer of the, uh, of the show and I can really feel that they are trying and get us involved as much as possible. I just hope it's not too late. On a personal uh, side, I really think that the industry should have the courage to put everything on the table to do so free of their history and pride and ultimately I think that we should merge the two big Swiss events, Baselworld and SIHH, come back to a single event a year with all the players under one same roof. Yes, these are trade fairs, but they can't only be that. I mean, for instance, having part of the event dedicated solely to the business side of things during some reserved days, and then the remaining days focused on the public, the press, to, I mean, host conferences and forums, be more interactive, display the crafts and artisan, the schools, include the vintage world, have auction houses involved, for instance. So yes, I may be a little bit dreaming, but wouldn't that be so fantastic? A single moment where we could all mingle. And this could be done either in Basel, I mean, it's a hundred year old and legitimate event, but why not in Geneva? And have this managed by people that are real event organizers, not only people kind of simply renting out square meters or in the case of the SIH mainly by one of the power group of the industry meaning Richemont. I know there is a lot of politics behind all this but for the sake of the industry as a whole for Switzerland to shine even better I really think that this uh, would be part of a solution. A brave and courageous move for the greater good of watchmaking precisely at a, wom uh, at a moment when quality watchmaking is facing an inevitable shift of its environment like refusing to see yes that there might be a serious issue with global warming. Okay, I may sound a bit of an idealist, but you know my love for this industry, but sometimes I'm a get, uh, I get a bit scared of where things are going, to be very honest with you. And yes, I know we're heading to an even more digital world, but for me, mechanical time-telling device will always make me dream so much more than the latest gadget. And don't get me wrong, I do like gadgets a lot, too much. And we interrupt this program that you were most certainly thoroughly enjoying for some breaking news. A couple of hours after our primetime show had been recorded, our editorial room received a shocking press release sent from both the SIHH and Baselworld announcing that as of 2020, both shows will now take place one directly after the other. 
Hallelujah. They talk to each other and going in the right direction and schedule has been seriously revised. No longer will people come and freeze in Geneva in January as the SI change will now occur between the 26th of April through the 29th, followed directly by Baselworld from the 30th till the 5th of May 2020. And this synchronization of both events has been agreed till 2024. Let's hope they will make it till then. Okay, let's be a little bit less cynical. And yes, this is good news, but we'll have some consequences. There are a few brands one way or another on both venues. I'm thinking, for instance, that some independent brands from the Carré des Horlogers, such as MBNF, Urbeck, H. Moser, and other members of this gang. So what will they choose? Stay at the SHH or go to Basel World? Well, personally, I'm pretty sure that Basel World will do what it takes to make them choose Basel, better rates and so forth, and the SIH will focus back on the big names. But as mentioned in the current prime time, you have many brands organizing special exhibitions and sales meetings in Geneva during this January week. The LBMH Armada of Tag, Hublot and Zenith for instance, and plenty of other ones in various hotels scattered around the city. So naturally, all these guys will stop this, and for Geneva, this will represent quite a loss in terms of accommodations and so forth. But at the same time, it means savings for all, and this is good precisely at a moment when people are starting to count very seriously their their marketing budgets and maybe this will free up some resources to organize more things coming your way who knows anyhow for us this will also have some consequences because to cover both venues will for sure be a real watch marathon or even Iron Man material already looking forward to the logistics of this and better get some serious training by then okay you may now return to your current primetime program enjoy Okay, let's continue with some trends witnessed this year and I will talk a bit more about the retail side of things, in particular this digital side, as many brands are now offering direct online sales and when you can, uh, when you can more or less buy anything on the web, well it's about time that this solution uh, was finally proposed. I naturally don't think it will ever supplement the actual physical side of the business, nothing better to go and test the watches yourself, but sometimes it's simply difficult to do so and when you think since when people have been purchasing second-hand watches on platforms such as eBay, well it definitely proved that uh, many were already willing to buy watches through a simple click. But there is a clear distinction between new products and a second-hand one and that's also why we see more and more brands coming up with uh, more concept store-like experiences. Not only do brands internalize part of the margins by doing so, but very importantly they want you to feel the brand, experience the brand and this is something which has been very successful for instance for Richard Mille since already a few years. But now we see Audemars Piguet coming up uh, with uh, dedicated lounges, a trend also witnessed with IWC and more recently by Bright I mean, it's a clear shift and we go away from a simple retail shop to something more personal. There's a club dimension and this uh, for me is something we will see more and more in the future and I quite like it. I mean, owning an object is one thing but living an experience purchasing it makes it definitely more fun and meaningful. And talking about the second-hand market and digital, well, I naturally had to come back on some big moves this year. In particular, the acquisition of Watchfinder by the Richmond Group after their full takeover of Mr. Porter. So now they master both ends, new and second-hand uh, uh, digital sales. And naturally, this will enable them to pump in the system some unsold watches. It seems uh, they've uh, already been pretty successful at it and generating some serious revenue with both endeavors. But uh, we've all seen, uh, also seen uh, traditional platforms such as eBay strengthening the seriousness of transactions made there with some kind of trustworthy certification, uh, certification of sellers. Well, I mean, the competition on the digital side of things is for sure getting fiercer and fiercer and fiercer, but I still like to go and wander around some tiny boutique and find this special piece, talk about it with the seller, negotiate a little bit, well, some, uh, something nice and obviously human too. But when you talk secondhand, well, what can we say about the world of auctions? I mean, the trend of crazy prices has continued and the refuge value of some pieces is uh, more than proven with some clear confirmed winners. For instance, more and more Rolex watches having reached some real stratospheric prices and we don't see this uh, really changing. And completely on a side note, I'm pretty sure that the success of these Rolex contributes partly in today's hype for the brand. I mean, it shows a signal of true worth. It's reassuring though, I mean, the, the brand has never been been as successful as today, producing record number of watches, despite the steel product uh, drought witnessed everywhere and people willing to pay high premiums for this year's GMT. Absolutely crazy. But it's true that Rolex is the only brand that has always benefited from this hot commodity status, cash on the wrist. 
Anyhow, the, the big names of this auction industry are clearly actively doing what it takes to keep their hype around their business. For instance, they all got away from uh, contemporary watches apart from exceptional watches. But here too we start to see uh, new players trying to take a portion of the business. We saw for example Chrome24 coming with an online bidding solution, eBay mentioned before, and I'm pretty sure that in the near future we'll see some new initiatives and inventive collaborations such as this for instance, recent partnership between uh, Christie's and German brand Moritz Grossmann, who for the 10 year anniversary of the relaunch of the brand came out with a selection of 24 unique pieces exclusively sold by the auction house. So anyhow, what uh, would be really interesting to think about is what are the current modern pieces that might reach these uh, skyrocket prices in the next 20 years. Think about it, what could be the good gambles if you were willing to sit on your investment that long? I mean, just, just food for thought. Okay, one last thing I wanted to mention in terms of trends seen this year, and this I think is really going in the right direction. Well, it concerns the after-sales dimension of the business as more brands are increasing the duration of their warranties on their products. We had talked about Omega's overall extension to five years, but I just heard that Fabergé is now offering a 10-year warranty as long as you service your watch after five years. And please note that this service is free of charge. Okay, Fabergé is a big name, but kind of a challenger in the watch department compared to others. And it's a clever way of standing out. But I personally really like this idea. I really hope we'll see more of this in the future. It's a very good signal, one of trust that the brand has in its product. Trust it wants to establish with its customers. Well, a strong and positive message, one that proves once again that when you buy a mechanical watch, you buy something durable, something for eternity, like uh, some people would say. And obviously something unachievable, never with any electronic device, something, by the way, acknowledged by Apple's superstar designer Johnny I who recently said that they shouldn't have called the Apple Watch a watch. Okay, enough said about uh, some of these uh, trends of 2018. Can't wait to see what we'll, uh, we'll be in for in 2019 and it will start already in early January with the SIHH here in Geneva. It's a slightly revised version lasting four days instead of five, a few more brands existing uh, nevertheless. But at the same time, quite a lot of other brands will be hosting events and shows in Geneva and we'll do our best to cover these other venues. I promise we'll also soon announce uh, what our Watches Club will be all about, for instance, with uh, more of these watch tripping experiences for our dear members. And please remember that all our patrons will become automatic members. So if you want to join the club, well, link below. Okay, I know it feels a bit uh, pushy, but sometimes it has to be done. And coming back on some of our yearly videos, I really think you guys liked uh, these uh, walkthrough videos, some more coming. Same regarding the Don't Do This At Home segment with our good friend uh, Peter. And we'll also continue with our Who's Who of Watchmaking, one episode coming very shortly regarding a big historical name, Breguet. Also wanted to mention that it's uh, this time of the year for some serious watch porn and we'll soon publish some of our best shots of 2018 and I know you guys also like this. So a bit less talking from me, just a moment of pleasure for the eyes and I hope it will slightly compensate from today's primetime speech. And additional to this, we will also publish a special video about this year's winner of the GPHG, that's uh, Beauvais and its Grand Recital R22, because in a previous interview with Mr. Pascal Raffi, we had uh, talked together about the three members of this impressive family of uh, recital watches. And since that over the years we had the chance of filming all three, well, this will be another nice little treat for the eyes. Okay, time to say goodbye. And on behalf of the small but totally dedicated team of the Watches TV, I just wanted to wish you a very happy Christmas from our Geneva Club. A fantastic new year and yes, off we go for tra our traditional Viva watchmaking celebration, but let's make it a little bit special and Viva! Viva! watchmaking. I always want to do this, so see you real soon. Thanks for watching, commenting, sharing and active support. We feel blessed. Thank you so much.